our dear viewers and listeners. We greet you all in the wonderful and precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Yet again, we say, This is the day the Lord has made. And we shall rejoice and be glad in it. As we begin today's Bible study, we ask you to invite somebody to join you. And as we begin, let's dedicate this moment to God in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Yes, Lord. For the reading of your word. Mm -hmm. Open our hearts. We open our hearts yes, to receive your word. Yes, Let it work in us. Yes, a work only God can do. Yes, that your word may work in us yes, to change as many as we hear it yes, to the praise and glory of your name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We will take today's reading from the very last verses of this wonderful book of Revelation. And we shall be reading from verse 18 to verse 21. As we end this wonderful journey about the revelation of Jesus Christ that God has personally given to us. Let's read the text. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life. From the holy city. And from the things which are written in this book. He who testifies to the thing says, Surely I'm coming quickly. Amen. Amen. Even so come Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Amen. As we get these closing remarks. We we'll need to reflect at the times that we live in. Because many people today think that the word of God is not enough. That somehow they need, they must supplement to it in order for them to have a close relationship with God. Now on the other hand, there is another group of people which view the word of God as outwardly wrong or not in sync with the times. And therefore, it needs to be modified. Certain portions need to be removed. So that do not fit what they think God is saying or what God intended. But as Christians, when we look at the text that we just read, we say that the Bible is true. And the word that is often used here is the term sufficient. So when we say that the Bible is sufficient, what is it that we mean? I will quote the words of one theologian called Wayne Gruden. When Grudem said in his book Systematic Theology and I quote 
He says the sufficiency of scripture means that scripture contained all the words of God. He intended his people to have at each stage of redemptive history. Basically what he means that the 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 story of redemption as we have it in the Bible, God made revelation as was needed for the time in history. For example, Abraham did not need to know that Jesus Christ would die on the cross for our sins. That was for other prophets to reveal. The revelation that he had was that through him all nations would be blessed. Now the sufficiency of scripture means that what God revealed was sufficient for that stage of the redemptive story. And he goes on to say, and it now contains all the words of God that we need for salvation. For trusting him, perfectly, and for obeying him perfectly. So by sufficiency we mean that the Bible Bible is the supreme authority of all matters of doctrine and of practice. This is what our reformers refer to as sola scriptura. Now, sola scriptura is a Latin word. And basically what it meant, from sola we get the word basis. Or ground. And scriptura is writings. Scriptura which refers to the scriptures. So basically what they were saying that the basis for life, the basis for practice, and the basis for faith is only the word of God. Now, also, this doesn't mean that God does not speak today. God does speak today through spirit-filled leaders. He does speak in visions and in dreams. He even speaks in audible voices if he so chooses. But all these forms of communication are better classified as illumination and not revelation. And they must conform to scripture. So back to the text that we read. In verse 18 and verse 19. Two provisions right come through. Number one. He tells us not to add anything to what was said. And in the event that you are, there is a consequence. And the consequence of that is that the plagues pronounced in the text will be added to you. The second provision is not to take anything away. Lest your privileges be taken away. 
So where you and I stand, we are to take the word of God in its entirety. So what John is making clear here is in the text context of the book of Revelation. And he's basically saying we must read it in its fullness and not intentionally seek to distort it. But the same principle applies to all scripture. The book of 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 tells us that all scripture is God breathed. It was given to us by the inspiration of God. Now, if it is being given to us, we need to go back to the very beginning of how God instructs us to keep his word and what attention he desires that we give to it. Let's look at the first set of books in the Bible. Those are the first five books which we call the Pentateuch. At the end of those books, which is in the book of Deuteronomy, this is the instruction Moses gives. He says, Now, O Israel, chapter 4, verse 1 to 2. He says, listen to the statutes and the judgment which I teach you to observe that you may live and go into the land to possess it which the Lord God of your fathers is giving you and he adds you shall not add to the word which I command you no take from it that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you here he is cautioning the children of Israel to listen to the word of God to obey the commandments of God neither adding neither subtracting to the word of God. Come Proverbs. Chap- Proverbs 30, verse 5 to 6. We have a similar admonition. Look at what the Bible says. It says, Every word of a God is pure. The Bible says, Every word of God is pure. The Bible says, Every word of God is pure. The Bible says, Every word of God is pure. To those who put their trust in him, do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. In other words, the word of God is sufficient on its own. There is nothing you need to add to it, it is sufficient for life. You see, the battle in the Christian service in the 20th century focused around the heresy of the Bible that was sorted everyone determined that the Bible does not have an error. Now, in the 21st century, the focus moved. Now, it is no longer about whether it has an error or not. Because that question was settled. When you believe, your sins are forgiven if you believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. 
He said, In my name, you shall lay hands upon the sick and they shall get well. That is not debatable anymore. He said, You shall cast out demons in my name. There is no debate about it. In his name, demons flee. The point we are driving now, the focus, is about the sufficiency. Is the Bible self-sufficient. And this is the battle of this century. So why is it a big deal? You You may ask. First, I need to take you back to the place. And why the place? Why do? Let's go for a moment. Here, John, Yokana is receiving this instruction in the new Jerusalem, in the new Eden. If you read verse 1 to verse 5 of chapter 22. Now, if we go back to the beginning, where did man fall? In the first Eden. Genesis 3 chapter 3 verse 3 how did he fall? man fell because the woman added to scripture look at what the woman responded when when Satan asked she said we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it. And then she adds, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. What did God say? Genesis chapter 2 verse 17. This is what God said. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. God did not talk about touching. Where does the touching come in? It is adding to the sufficiency of scripture. And what does the devil do? The devil then subtracts everything. God said, you shall surely die. Satan comes in chapter 3 and verse 4 and says you will not surely die. What he adds was the not. God said you shall surely die. Then what does Satan do? Add one word. Not. And she believed it. Now, here, we then see the consequences today of that disobedience. So it is befitting that this book now ends with a warning to us taking us back to where it all began that whatever God says he means it. So in our day to day you may ask how do we add and how do we subtract? And I will give you four reasons how we add and how we subtract. Number one, by disobeying. That is by willfully rebelling against the clear commands of scripture. And we come up with so many excuses to try and twist it a bit. Willfully 
Just saying, God, I will not do it. The second way we disobey, or the second way we add or subtract, is by disregarding. Now, disregarding is different from disobeying. Disregarding is ignoring. You just say, I will not be bothered. I will just go and do my thing. I will not be bothered by what God says. Once he says there is no there is no salvation in any other. Except Jesus Christ. He said, that one will not bother me. I, I, I will just go with what I feel. And you say, after all, all roads lead to Rome. And I say, how about the scripture that says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Mm. No one comes to the Father except me. Mm. So don't disturb me with that. I just disregard that. So we end up disregarding what God has said. The third D is distorting. Now, distorting is purposefully twisting the true meaning of God's word so that it accommodates your opinion. And today we do it so casually. You, you get the word yourself. So what is the Latin meaning of that? What, what is the Hebrew? What is the Greek? And what is the root of that Greek? Then you go to what is the root of that Hebrew? And and before you know it, you get the root and say, this is what God meant. And you substitute what God has said for what you think. So you get your theology. And you now want God's word to support what you think. When you would do that, you are adding or subtracting to the word. The fourth day is diluting. Here we add traditions. We add texts. We seek people who we think have authoritative truth. So that they add to what is already there. And soon we lose meaning of the whole thing. I have had a lot of people who make a mockery of the miracles that Jesus performed. And they try to say, no, you see the 5,000, the feeding, they went and bought bread. It's all a mess. You see, and when we do that, you are either adding and when you add, you are adding to the pledges. When you subtract, you are subtracting from the privileges. So we need to take God at his word. And I will give you a classic example of various faith that we have today. And in the interest of time, we will not go to the depth of every one of them. Let's begin with the Islamic faith. The prophet Muhammad, Muhammad, he claimed he was sent from God to restore true monotheism. And then he offered to the world the Quran. 
kulani as the perfect and final revelation of god why taking away the key doctrines such as the deity of jesus christ why is the deity of jesus christ important because all have seen and fallen short of the glory of god when man fell, all fell. So it had to take a holy man. It had to take one who is without sin to die on behalf of all sinners. And we know that there is only one who is perfect. That is God. So it had to take God to die. Now God is eternal. So he can't die. So then God had to become man so that the man dies. Taking on the sin of all men. So that then we receive the righteousness that is by faith. So the death of Jesus Christ is very important. Concerning the redemption of mankind. Now he denies the Trinity. That is the Godhead of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That is blasphemy. For so we have God the Father at the baptism of Jesus Christ. We have this perfect picture. Jesus comes to John to be baptized. And the Bible says, and the heavens were opened, and the voice was heard from heaven, saying, this is my son, in whom I'm well pleased. But in that moment, the spirit descended in the form of a dove. We see God the Father saying, this is my son. We see Jesus being baptized. And we see the Holy Spirit descend in the form of a dove. And in various portions of scripture, we see the Godhead being made manifest in various scriptures. And we shall come back to that much later as the series goes on. And what else? Salvation by grace and faith. And all of them point to salvation by what? Outside of Jesus Christ. There is no salvation in any other. When Jesus was to be born, the message from the angel told Joseph and told Mary, you shall give birth to a son and he shall save his people from their sins. And we we'll receive that by grace through faith in him. Not by works lest any man should go. The other one we will talk about is is Joseph Smith. Yusuf Smith. That is the founder of the Latter day Saints. All the moments. He announced that all Christian denominations were apostate. And he alone was God's chosen vessel to restore the faith. I have had the opportunity to read the Book of Mormon. The doctrine of covenants and the pearl of great price. Three books which try to define their true doctrine. 
And what I find there is that the Jesus that we preach as depicted by the scripture is different from the one they are saying. Theirs is a creation. Ours is the creator. The Bible tells us that all things come originate through him. He maintains all things. And all things point towards him. Paul says, in him we live, in him we move, in him we have our being. He is the beginning and the end. He is the first and the last. He is the one who was, who is, and who is to come. He is the eternal. God. And we cannot run away from that. Let's look at another person. Charles Taze Russell. Charles Taze Russell. Now, Charles Taze Russell and Joseph Franklin Rutherford. These are the ones responsible for Jehovah's Witness. And among us, the things that come through when you read that documentation. They first of all believe that Jesus is the Archangel Michael. Which is complete disregard to what the Bible says in John chapter 1 and verse 1. That in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. So, Jesus is the word incarnate. And we cannot run away from that fact. Jehovah's Witness believe that salvation is a combination of faith good works and then obedience which is a contradiction to scripture which declares that salvation is by grace through faith John 3.16 says for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Inside. That whosoever believes, not whosoever does, not whosoever is a good person, but whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So if it depends upon your works, then it ceases to be a grace act. They also reject Jesus being God. They say he is a creation. And the Holy Spirit is an inanimate power. So it is not God. How come Jesus referred to him in the first person as a person? He says, when he shall come, he will teach you all things. How can a force teach you? No. You see, we need to go back to scripture. They reject the concept of Jesus' substitutionary death. And instead hold that this ransom theory, Jesus' death was a, a, a ransom payment for Adam's sin. So not our sins, but not our sin, but Adam's sin. And that is against scripture because scripture says when Adam sinned, all sin. Bible but Adam So all of us through Adam sin. And through the obedience of the last Adam. Then when we have faith in his redemptive work, 
we are justified. We do kiriza mumuli mugo go yakola anga atugula tuwe wobu tu kirifu. Justified by faith. But tuwe wobu tu kirifu okuva muku kiriza. Can we go to the seventh day Adventist? Today we move to get them by seventh day. And look at a woman called Ellen G. White. So to take a room chair on the writer Ellen G. White. Regarded as one of the pioneers of their faith. Yomu kwa baba tani we can zikirize. And she was a great promoter of the keeping of the Sabbath. Yeya ya akuriza nyecho kuku. Which is contrary to what Romans chapter 14 and verse 5 says. She also said she had a revelation that hell is not eternal. And this contradicts the very teaching of Jesus Christ concerning eternal punishment. As it brings it forward to us in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 46. Ellen also says in her teaching that the sins of of sinners will be placed upon Satan as a scapegoat. And this is in her book, The Great Controversy. Which is contrary to what the Bible says. In 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 24. Which says he himself talking about Jesus bore our sins in his body. Now, she also says that Jesus is the Archangel Michael, which is contrary to what we see in Jude, verse 9. Because in Jude, verse 9, the angel Michael rebukes the devil and says the Lord rebuke you. So Jesus could not be Angel Michael. Angel Michael is referring to somebody else. Now, I know a lot of people don't agree with some Seventh-day Adventists don't agree with what Ellen White wrote. And there is a lot concerning the nature of Christ. But I want to quote something that was written. And it is documented in the general conference that was heard in Netherlands, the year 1995. I quote, this is the submission of the conference. It says, we consider the biblical canon closed. However, we also believe as did Ellen G. White contemporaries that her writings carried divine authority both for God living and for doctrine. Basically what that means is that you elevate her writings and bring it to the level of scripture. Adding the sufficiency of the word of God. Let's go to Catholicism and look at the catechism. Right in there. The Catholic Church states that both scripture and tradition must be accepted and honored with equal sentiments of devotion and reverence. In other words, tradition and no, no, hold the same authority as scripture. No wonder 
When the Reformation came, you had the Sola Scriptura, which was the mantra, which was the rallying cry. Because there is a lot that is unacceptable and is not in line with the Word of God. The prayer to saints, infant baptism, indulgence, the papa authority as the one who does not as the one who does not err in doctrine that is against scripture it is against what scripture reveals to us and I will quote the words of one man called Joseph Sais he says oh my friends it is a fearful thing to suppress or stratify the word of God and above all the words of prophecy of this book. It says to put forth for truth what is not true. To denounce as error, condemn, repudiate, and emasculate what God himself has set his seal as his mind and purpose. Is one of those high crimes. Not only against God, but against the souls of men. And this cannot go unpunished. You see, when error is propagated, it has only one God to lead people astray. And when people are led astray, the consequences can be devastating. It is a matter of life and death. Now the Bible here, having looked at the top, don't add and don't subtract carries with it lesser warnings and these are two the first one is the admonition against understanding the book of revelation wrongly so this is getting the word of God as revealed by God. And you then try to impose your imagination on this imagery of the word of God. And by consequence, you misrepresent the word of God. This not only brings harm to yourself, but but it also brings harm to the others. The lesser warning, the second one, is neglect. This is where people say, no, the book of Revelation, that one, the Revelation of Jesus Christ, no, I will not bother with that one. Its language is beyond my understanding. Here, this is also dangerous. Because you miss out on the benefits that comes with understanding the revelation of Jesus Christ. Why is the book of Revelation important? Because here is embedded divine truth the mind of God concerning so many things. Number one, it confirms the deity of Jesus Christ. He was not just human. He was a hundred percent God. This book cements the doctrine of the triune God. This book also cements 
the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. Now, understanding that, then you understand that there is no other sacrifice required to pay for the sins of humanity. And not just the sins of humanity, but also the effects of of sin to humanity. The only sufficiency that is required is what was paid for at Calvary. So the sacrifice you and I have to pay is the sacrifice of obedience to what the scriptures tell us. And what is it that is required of us? Faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. So there's no other sacrifice to pay. There is nothing. Number four. From here we understand that there will be a, a physical resurrection of the saints. There will be a physical re resurrection of the bodies of all mankind. And when that happens, those that have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ will then receive their reward. And those that have not believed on him will then be judged and be thrown in the lake of fire for all eternity. May I state that purgatory does not fit the picture here. The next one that we see is the salvation by grace through faith. This is entrenched in the book of Revelation. Also entrenched here is the urgency of the gospel. Why we need to go to all corners of the earth and preach this gospel of the kingdom to all creation. The next one that we see here is the imminent return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The reality of the future resurrection when he shall come down and the dead in Christ shall rise. Then those who will be around will be caught up and together we will be with the Lord. That resurrection, the Bible says, creation is honestly waiting for the manifestation of the truth sons of God. And along with that, there is the final judgment. Where those that have not believed on Jesus Christ, whose names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, will be thrown in the lake of fire. Where we find the devil, the prophet and the antichrist, and all the angels that rebelled against the majesty and the holiness of God. They will find also the promise of new heavens and a new earth when the old has gone away and the new has come. It is not just the experience that you gain at salvation but we also have the understanding that, that all that we see around us the world as we know it will be Pass away. And what will come back, what will replace it, will be more glorious. For the glory of God shall cover his people. And God will dwell with his people for all eternity. So to avoid studying the book of Revelation, 
revelation is to decline what Jesus has given to us. To decline the blessing that comes with reading it. And then Jesus himself in verse 20 declares he who testifies of these things says I am coming quick. He reminds us of his imminent return. Now you may say it is more than 2,000 years since he said this. Why should we believe it? We should believe it because of three reasons. Number one, because he is the eternal son of God. He is our savior. His work on our behalf has begun. And until he resurrects us, judges the sinner, rewards the faithful, purges all creation of sin and its effects, creates a new heaven and a new earth. The work is not yet finished. There is still something he has to do. Secondly, Jesus cannot lie. It goes against his very nature. God cannot lie. The scriptures say it is impossible for God to lie. Thirdly, his saying I'm coming quickly needs to be looked at in the context of his mercy. He is waiting for you and I that have not believed on him to come to him. Secondly, his delay is for the work of the Spirit the Spirit to do its work in you. And I perfecting us to conform to the image of Jesus Christ. Number three, Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 and 9, he says a day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years like a day. The promise is I am coming quickly. It is not an angel of promise. He is not saying I will send an exalted man. He is not saying I am sending an invisible force. He promised the Holy Spirit will come. And on the day of Pentecost, he came. Now he says, I am coming. Anytime. He will come. And he will come physically. Acts chapter 1, verse 10 and 11. The angel tells the apostles. Says, why are you standing in the heaven? And he says, this same Jesus who has ascended physically into heaven will come in the same manner. So what is the response upon this exciting news? When John heard this, his response was, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus Christ. And today, we share the same enthusiasm as we respond. You see, as we read his word, as we meditate upon it, as we allow the Holy Spirit to creating us a new image after Jesus Christ. We are declaring 
tuogera. Amen. Amina. Come, Lord Jesus. Jangu mukama Yesu jangu. As we worship him. Ngatumu sins. As we join the chorus of fellow believers and the saints in heaven. Ngatu damu area wa muna wa tu kufuna wa tu kufabali mugu. We are proclaiming. Tuberanga abogera. Amen. Amina. Come, Lord Jesus. Come. Jangu mukama Yesu jangu. As we get on our knees and pray. Ngatu vunama o kusaba. Seeking the heart of God. Ngatu fukamiri o kuno nyo mukama. And allow God to deal with our hearts. Our deepest cry. He's saying amen. Come Lord Jesus come. As we go out with this news of glad tidings. To every creation. Telling them that Jesus says. We are declaring. Amen. Come Lord Jesus come. As we give back to God of the time that he has given us and the treasures that he has bestowed us with, and walk in this sinful world in this world that is fallen as though we are in a fallen world we are saying amen come Lord Jesus come is that your response? He winds and says, There is grace for you. Right now, there is still a moment of grace. If you have not received Jesus in your life, this is your moment. Jesus yes. will come in your life and you will join the chorus of those that are eagerly waiting for him and are saying, let it be so. Come, Lord Jesus. Today is your day of salvation. Why don't you say this prayer? Right to the message. Say, dear Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Savior of the world, and I am a sinner. I need a Savior in my life. You came down and died on the cross of Calvary for my sins. I believe that you rose again from the dead on the flood. And Lord of glory, today, I entrust you with my life, with my future, with everything concerning me. Save me now, Lord. Wash away my sins. Write my name in the book of life. Thank you for saving me. Now, Lord, I pray. Fill me with your holy and help me to live this life for you. For your glory, for your honor, and for your faith. Thank you, Lord, for saving Amen. Amen. Now, if you say that prayer, you have been wonderfully saved. For the believer, we have the work to do. As we say, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus Christ. We need to do what is expected of us. We need to read His word. Meditate on it. Allow the Spirit to do His work. We need to worship together. We need to pray and seek God's heart concerning our lives, concerning His purpose for our lives. And then do what He places upon us. But most importantly, we need to take this gospel to all parts of the world, telling them of the good news of the Savior who loved us and gave himself for our sins. May God bless you as you take the revelation of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the uttermost parts of the earth. From Dominion Church, we are saying shalom. God bless you.